God is looking for a witness. He's looking for one that will represent him before the world. We are told never a man spake like Christ because never a man lived like Christ. And even the very soldiers that went to arrest Jesus was confounded by his life. All right, let's, let's pray together. Just reverently bow your heads as I pray. Eternal Father, indeed I recognize my frailty. Yet still, if, if it's just my frailty, then it would be in vain for me to be here. Lord, I'm trusting you and I just surrender to you afresh. I pray that you may speak to your people. And may Jesus be lifted up, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as you can see, the topic there, it's an ongoing series, this part three, Behold the Lamb of God. Uh, however, the subtitle, as you can see on my slide there, is Behold the Man. Behold the Man. Let's go in our Bibles quickly. I hope you brought your Bibles with you. I know the media personnel are going to do their best uh, to try and put the text on the screen however i always encourage for us to take our bibles with us so that we can follow along amen all right so let's go to john chapter 1 that's our spring text there john chapter 1 and verse 29 john chapter 1 and verse 29 notice what the bible says john chapter 1 verse 29 are you all there it says the next day john seeing jesus cometh coming unto him and say it what? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, Jesus said something interestingly. You know, in his time, that's John's time and Jesus' time, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. He called them to look. Look why? Because he was the one that would bring salvation. Now, Jesus records clearly in the book of John, chapter 3, he said, if I be lifted up, I will what? Draw all men unto me. Now, there's something about us looking to Jesus as he's lifted up on the cross. Now, it's amazing that Jesus is the king of glory. But the shame came before the glory. Are you with me? And so as a result, our master, there's something about his life, something about his passion, something about his death, something about what he endured that we should look and behold. And it will cause us to recognize the love of God in a more meaningful way. Now we are told, uh, that we will never renounce sin until we see the sinfulness of sin. And we can only see that in the light of Calvary. What our sins did to Jesus, yet still while uh, we are in this situation, we might truly be helpless to help ourselves. But while we're helpless, we're not hopeless. God has a plan for each and every one of us that is here. And his purposes will be fulfilled. His purpose is for you to be with him. I want to tell you this much. Jesus went on a rescue mission, and that is to bring us back into fellowship with the omnipotent one. It's amazing that we are just a little speck. In fact, I didn't plan to go there, but turn with me to, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. Let's go there. Hebrews uh, chapter 1. Let's see what the Bible says here clearly. In retrospect to the earth, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2. Notice what the Bible says. And indeed, let's continue to pray for the media department as they endeavor to do their best to get the text on the screen. Amen. Notice what it says. God who had sundry times and in diverse manner. I'm reading verse 1 of Hebrews 1. Spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these... 
last day spoken unto us by his son whom he has appointed year of what all things by whom also he made the worlds now notice that context there it says what worlds it's amazing our little speck in this form of the universe we were that one sheep that was lost out of 90 and 9 that was back in the father's fold yet still jesus the one that created the worlds humbled himself came to this earth took our place we cannot really understand this love but john calls us to behold it and so as we study together as we study under the caption behold the man i pray that we may see jesus in a new light i pray also that we may choose jesus the man rather than barabbas which is a typology or a symbol of satan now interestingly as we look in our text let's go forward if i know as we continue time will fail us notice what we are told in the book of john john chapter 5 verse 30 he says i can what now who's speaking here jesus i can of mine own self do nothing amazing friends this is the king of the universe yet still he acknowledges that he can't do nothing of himself of course this was when he took on this earthly tabernacle as you would say it this earthly body jesus said i can of mine own self do nothing as i hear i judge now contextually speaking when he says nothing he follows up to say as i hear i judge so contextually he's saying i cannot of myself judge is that clear and my judgment is just why because if he cannot judge how is his judgments just because i do what i see not mine own will but the will of the father that sent me so question for you what is jesus hearing that he can just judge judge you know judge justly what is he hearing he's hearing his father's will so jesus was always in tune to his father's will in fact what it is saying to me is that jesus did not consider his own desires as long as they were contrary to the will of his father what an amazing submission and i think indeed we'd truly be even just better persons if not even christians to learn of christ of his humility of his meekness his lowliness and it's amazing that the strength of god is actually in his meekness for jesus represents the godhead that is a godhead that loves and that is the personification of humility now we cannot understand this when one that is higher than any other being is the most humble meek than any other being that's amazing what's also amazing to me is this world basically tells us that if you want something you have to do it yourself if you want to do it right this world pushes us to be the brightest the best there's nothing wrong with that but it lifts us up but in contrary jesus was humbled the kingdom of heaven is the epitome of humility self-sacrifice in fact jesus said it well in john in matthew chapter 11 verse 28 thereabout he said learn of me for i'm meek and lowly in heart and that's the only time we can find rest unto our souls now let's go to our text this morning as we speed on hastily uh john chapter 
18. Let's pick up from there. I know our, our, our text that was ably read, John chapter 19, 1 through 5. But we're going to pick up from John chapter 18. We're going to pick up from verse 28. John chapter 18, verse 28. So basically what I'm saying, friends, is that Jesus humbled himself. And there's something we can learn from his life that can lead us to find joy, peace, and a full surrender to Christ Jesus because of his tender love. Now notice what verse 28 says, Then led they Jesus to Caiapha, from Caiaphas, that was the high priest, unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. Now we have looked at part two and we see that Jesus was rudely, roughly brought by the mob to Annas the high priest. And he wasn't even tried as a dignified human being, lower than a human being, I would say. Jesus was hurried and hurled on accusations after accusation. He was smut and he spake not a word. As Isaiah tells us, as a sheep is dumb before her shearer, so he spake not a word. Isaiah chapter 50. Uh, 58, 53. And so we see, friends, that Jesus was before Annas and he was questioned, interrogated all through the night. That was Thursday night. And we saw that he was brought to Caiaphas and of course, they made up their mind that they were going to sentence Jesus to death. And falls witnesses were brought into the room and they accused jesus but interesting in none of them could corroborate each other's testimony yet still they weren't interested in corroboration nor what made sense or to find evidence against its innocence they were intent on crucifying jesus on killing the son of god because of envy we are told they hated jesus because he was so good it reminds me of that text in timothy he says yea all who live godly shall suffer persecution now you may say to yourself persecution in these times yes it's coming again but we are told that the godly is going to suffer what persecution could it be that we're not living godly lives that's why we're not suffering persecution now friends i must say this quickly that Jesus is looking for a witness. You know, my elder talk about a gospel. The gospel, by the way. The good news. But Jesus said it well in Matthew 28. He says, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world for a witness. And only then and then shall the end come. Now, the interesting part about this is that notice it says for a what? Witness. He's talking about living the life. You see, friends, it's easy to preach. It's easy to tell others. But we are told clearly that the well-ordered Christian life speak more in favor of the gospel than any sermon that is preached. God is looking for a witness. He's looking for one that will represent him before the world. We are told never a man spake like Christ because never a man lived like Christ. And even the very soldiers that went to arrest Jesus was confounded by his life. And so, as our narrative continues, Jesus is at Caiaphas, and Caiaphas rents his garment at receiving a vision of Jesus coming um, in the clouds of glory. And he said, what more have we with to hear from this man. And of course they sentenced Jesus to death. Now we pick up. Because here's the thing about it. While the Jews wanted to sentence Jesus to death. They needed the government. The Roman government. To affirm their sentence. And so here we see the story picks up in verse 28. They led Jesus from Caiaphas. Unto the hall of judgment. 
and it was early. Mark 15 verse 1 tells us that it was in the morning. Matthew 27 verse 1 says, when morning was come. And so we see, friends, that it was very early. Jesus had spent all night through abuse and insult and mockery. And he was exhausted. And in this rough manner, bounded, we are told, he was hauled off to the judgment all of Herod. We continue to say, and they themselves went not in the judgment hall, lest they should def be defiled. But, they, but that they might what? Keep the Passover. Very interesting, right? So picture the scene with me. As it is conveyed in the judgment hall of Pilate, Jesus stands there, bound. Of course, there are guards around him. And as these guards stand sure against him in the hall, the hall is filling up quickly with spectators. And of course, by the entrance are the Jewish leaders. Now turn with me quickly. Let's see who was there to the book of Mark. Mark 15. Mark 15 and verse 1. Let's look at a parallel verse. Mark, Mark 15 and verse 1. We know that the Sanhedrin um, council had tried him at Caiaphas' uh, mansion. But notice what we are told in verse 5, chapter 15 of Mark verse 1. And straight where in the morning, there we go. The chief priests and ad, uh, what consolidation with what? Ad head, sorry. Con a consolidation with the what? elders and scribes and the whole council that's the sanhedrin council right bound jesus and carried him away and delivered him to pilate now what's interesting is that they were on the outside because they did not want to defile themselves and so we see on the outside we have the judges of the sanhedrin we have the rulers we have the priests, we have the elders, and of course, we have the mob that followed. And so they said they didn't want to go in to defile themselves. What's interesting is while they did not want to defile themselves, it was interesting how they have hatred in their heart. They wanted to kill Jesus, and little did they know and understand that they were already defiled and they could not partake. Of the Passover. In fact, little did they know that Jesus was this Passover lamb. And now they were rejecting him, who the Jewish economy had centered upon. Yet still, they said they did not want to defile themselves. By the way, in the middle of all of this, as they were on their way, before they got to Pilate, there is something I must mention. Judas was there. The one that betrayed Jesus. And you can just jot this down in Matthew 27 and verse 3 to 10. Judas actually makes a confession. And he says when he, when he realized that they had condemned Jesus to death and they were now going to Pilate, they, Jesus, Judas said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And of course, these priests looked up on him and said, what have we to do with these? Judas threw, threw down the money that he had bargained, 30 pieces of silver. And they almost turned a frown to Judas and they went their way. We are told that Judas was so distraught that he had betrayed his master. Not true repentance, but that his plan did not work. For Jesus to exalt himself and what a sharp businessman he thought he was he would get the money for being the one that betrayed him and at the same time he would get the glory for being the one that forced him to reveal his true powers jesus did not reveal his power to deliver himself but rather he was led bound 
And as Judas made this confession, though in vain, we are told later on that he went and hung himself and the weight of his body broke the cable and the dogs mandled his body. What a sad way for such a prominent disciple to end his life. Now notice what we are told in this book, Desire of Ages. Very powerful book here. And I would encourage you to get your hands, get in your hands one copy of these, this book. It says here, when the Savior was brought into the judgment hall, Pilate looked upon him with no friendly eyes. The Roman governor had been called from his bedchamber in haste. And he determined to do his work as quickly as possible. He was prepared to deal with this the prisoner with magis magisterial severity. Assuming his severest expression, he turned to see what kind of man he had to examine. He had been called from his repose so early an hour. He knew that it must be someone whom the Jewish authorities were anxious to be tried. And punish and punished my friends with haste and so we see that they surely wanted to do this thing in ace and so notice what we are told furthermore Pilate looked at the men who had Jesus in charge then gay, his gaze rested searchingly on Jesus. He had had to deal with all kinds of criminals. But listen this. Never before had a man bearing marks of such goodness and nobility been brought before him. On his face he saw no sign of guilt, no expression of fear, no boldness or defiance. He saw a man calm and dignified, bear, and a dignified bearing whose countenance bore not the marks of a criminal, but the signature of heaven. Wow, what a testimony from a man that was in the world. You know, friends, it's interesting that often God can use even those in the world. Those that we claim to be unchurched. Those that we see are not Christians. You know, friends, God looks at the heart. And oftentimes, even though this man was not necessarily a Christian, God still used him. And I want to say, friends, if, if we're not willing to be used by God, God can use the stones to cry out. Here, God was using Pilate. Can you imagine the church at that time was there? And while they were willing to condemn Jesus to death, here, a ruler of a heathen nation was willing to acknowledge the goodness of Jesus. Amazing, right? And so, can you imagine this impression that was made on Pilate? Watch this. Christ's appearance made a favorable impression upon Pilate. His better nature was roused. He had heard of Jesus and his works. His wife had told him something of the wonderful deeds performed by this Galilean prophet who cured the sick and raised the dead. Now, this revived as a dream in Pilate's mind. He recalled rumors that he had heard from several sources. He resolved to demand of the Jews their charge against the prisoner. Pick up with me verse 29 of John. Pilate then went out unto them and saith, because they were at the entrance, they didn't want to defile themselves. What accusation bring he against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, I'm at verse 30 of John chapter 18. If he were not a malefactor, factor, we would not have delivered him up to thee. 
interestingly, Jesus was brought to Pilate. Pilate sought what accusation was given to be given against this man why they wanted Pilate to uh, to affirm their death sentence now these Jews didn't want a formal trial they wanted for Pilate to inflict a sentence of death upon a man that have not been tried they hope to impress upon him their importance why can you imagine the first men of israel the elders the sanhedrin council the priests the rulers the mob if he were not a malefactor why would we have delivered him unto you why are you saying this the fact that we are here should be good enough to take our word in fact we're at a season when it's our national festival in fact, do this as a favor for us, Pilate. And so verse 31 says, Then Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. Then the Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for, any, for us to put any man to death. You see, my friends, they were in somewhat of a dilemma. They were in a dilemma, my friends, because they recognized that they could not really truly bring the grounds in which they brought, they had arrested Jesus on. They had arrested Jesus on religious grounds. Pilate would have thrown it out as a heathen governor. And so they sought to conceal on the thick garb of hypocrisy their true intent for why they brought Jesus to Pilate. Verse 32, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying the death he would die. And so they sought to hide it under thick hypocrisy. Notice what we are told here, that Pilate, was not a just and conscientious judge. They're on the screen. But weak though he was in moral, he refused to grant this request. He would not condemn Jesus until a charge had been brought against him. Now, what's interesting to me is that, is, you see Pilate now, Pilate was a hardened ruler. It didn't really matter to Pilate whether you were innocent or guilty. As long as you're a prisoner, Pilate in time past had sentenced those to death that was innocent. But there was just something about Jesus that restrained him at that point from affirming what the Jews wanted. And so we see that they now accuse Jesus of what is considered as sedition. They sought to put before uh, Pilate put him before Pilate as a political offender. You see, sedition is when there is a sense of strong arguments or influence in some way, whether by writing or otherwise, to cause rebellion against the current government. In fact, Luke 23 and verse 2, you can write it down. They accused Jesus of three things. They said, this man pervert the nation. Forbidding, secondly, to give tribute to Caesar. And thirdly, saying that he himself is Christ the king. So he is king himself. And they lined that up against Caesar. And they said, listen to me. If you don't charge this man for a crime then you're not Caesar's friend. And so they were willing to be charged with perjury because they would not allow this golden opportunity to slip from them. For while they did not have a true argument, they started to uh, encourage false witness to come forward when you read the line of story. And none of them could corroborate each other even at this moment. 
and they all testified of the same that this man perverted the nation. Yet still they could not find any meaningful evidence that this was so. In all of this, Jesus was silent. He spake not a word under such abuse. Verse 33, Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Is this true? Jesus answered and said unto him, verse 34, Say thou these things of thyself, or did others tell thee of me? In other words, the Holy Spirit was working on Pilate's heart. Even though he was an ardent governor, he recognized that they had brought him for some other reason, for hatred probably, or envy. This man had no bearing of criminality that he could condemn him. And so we see that as Pilate questioned him, verse 35, Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Pride sprang up in him, and he would not recognize the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Thine own nation, verse 35, and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? What hast thou done, my friends? Said this ruler to Jesus. Verse 36. And Jesus said, answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight that I should not be delivered in to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into what? The world, that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth, hear my voice. Verse 38, Pilate then said unto him, What is truth? But before Pilate could get an answer, he was taken immediately back to the angry angry throng that was waiting for an answer on the outside we are told that and when he had said this he went out again unto the jews and said unto them i find what no fault in him i find no fault in him now let's pick up quickly as we are there Let's go in our Bibles to, uh, at this time, let's go to Luke 23. Let's go to Luke 23, a parallel chapter to there. Luke 23. Let's go to Luke 23. Let me go forward with this. Luke 23. Luke 23 in our Bibles. Let's, let's look at this and let's pick up at verse 5. Notice what occurred. When, G, when Pilate says, I find no fault in him. You see, he, was, he didn't want to condemn Jesus. He knew that something was off. But at the same time, the mob was demanding angrily that he condemn Jesus. And so verse 3, verse 2. It says, then they began to, call, to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation, forbidden to give tribute to Caesar, saying, He himself is what? Christ the King. Verse 3, Then Pilate said, Art thou a king? Similar to what he said before. Verse 4, Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find what? No fault in him. Notice what happened now. Verse 5. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirred up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Now, when Pilate heard that, Pilate found an escape route. He asked whether this man was a Galilean. And you know what he did? He sent him over to Herod's. So Jesus was now hurried to Herod, Herod's judgment all. 
And as he was hurried there, uh, we are told that Herod longed to see him. And in, as he came there and, and Herod saw him, that Herod desired for him to work a miracle. And he said, work a miracle and I'll release you. That's what Herod said to him. But of course, Jesus spake not a word. In so much that Herod marveled. And so, because Jesus would not work a miracle in Herod's presence to deliver himself, he arrayed him with his men. And they smote Jesus. And they beat upon Jesus. And Herod left him to the mob. And they literally would have teared Jesus to pieces. Except the soldiers intervened. And as a result, and you can find it also as you keep reading there, it actually tells you in, 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 in Luke, the same chapter that I was just reading, Luke 23. If you keep reading, you'll see what I'm saying. But they almost teared Jesus to pieces from 5 to 16. And of course, the, 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 guard, the guards had to intervene, the Roman guards had to intervene. But notice what we are told here. Watch this, friends. I want to read this for you. You see, while Herod was doing his work and beating upon Jesus, and while Jesus spake not a word, notice what we are told here on the screen. There were some who trembled in Christ's presence. While the rude throng were bound and mocking before him, some who came forward for that purpose turned back, afraid and silence. Herod was convicted. The last rays of mercy were shining upon his sin hardened heart. Watch this now. He felt that this was no common man. Even Herod. Watch this now, friends. Divinity had flashed through humanity at the very time when Christ was encompassed by mockers, idolaters, and murderers. Herod felt that he was beholding a God upon his throne. Amazing, right? And it, it so impressed him, even though he was inflicting it, that he wished to relieve himself from the responsibility. So guess what Herod did? He sent him back to Pilate. Now, how do you think Pilate felt about this? Pilate wanted to relieve himself of this responsibility. But now, here Jesus and the mob and the hungry throng was right back where they began with Pilate. Notice what we are told now. Verse 29. But he have a 39. But he have a custom. That I should release. This is Pilate now speaking. Because Pilate re realized that Herod didn't find any fault in him. I didn't find a fault in him. But he cannot escape. Now Pilate devised a plan. And he says to himself. Hmm. If they won't just release him based on the merit of what I've said. I'm going to do something. I'm going to compare Jesus with Barabbas. Not only am I going to do that, but listen what it says here. It says, ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Verse 40. Then cried they, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Now, what did they charge Jesus for? Sedition. Interestingly, when you parallel this verse, with Luke 25, 19, it tells us that Barabbas was taken for sedition and for insurrection. And he was a murderer, literally. So here was two. By the way, Jesus, Barabbas was a type of Christ. Why? Because he had made himself to say that to the people that he was Christ. And he had had a following, but he took it under satanic delusion he sought to murder and to cause an uprising against the Romans. And they captured him. Now, Pilate had this wise idea. I'm going to compare him. 
But notice what we are told here in 19 verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Wow. Now, here was a weak point on Pilate's part that they saw through. If you find no fault in him, why would you scourge him? But you see, his thought was to scourge him, to mock him, and then to put him in comparison to Barabbas. And so, get this now. Jesus had gone all night before under the cruelty of the high priests, the abuse of the soldiers, and he was hauled like a rag to and fro from one high priest to another. Then he was brought to Pilate. Then he was brought to Herod early in the morning. By this time, it was about the sixth hour, 12 o'clock. Then Herod now, then, Pilate, then, then Herod abused abused him until they almost tore him to pieces then he was brought back to Pilate and now Pilate scourged him we are told in inspiration that the blood flow freely from his wounds and Jesus now was indeed under the pressure of the bearing as he was humanity he was weak he was tired. And as they scourged him on top of that, and I can tell you this much, my friends, those Romans really gave it to him. They, verse 2, they plotted, the soldier plotted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and put a robe, and we are told that they mocked him in other accounts. They spat upon him. One rude hand would... Uh, draw, drive the, 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 the thorns in his brow and blood ro flowed freely down his beard. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him and smiting him with their hands. And Pilate says, Notice verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth unto you, that he may know I what? I find no fault in him. Amazing, right? And to this end, Christ never complained. But, Christ, but, but Pilate was not left to carry out this demise without some warning. He says in answer to Christ's prayer, do you know that Christ was praying for Pilate? The wife of Pilate had been visited by an angel from God, heaven. And in a dream, she had beheld the Savior and conversed with him. Pilate's wife was not a Jew, but she looked, she looked upon Jesus in her dream and she had no doubt of his character of our mission. She knew him to be the Prince of God. Watch this. She saw him on trial in her dream. In the judgment hall, she saw the hands tightly bound as the hands of a criminal. She saw Herod and his soldiers doing their dreadful work. She heard the priests and rulers filled with envy and malice madly accusing him. She heard words, we have a law and by our law he ought to die. She saw Pilate give Jesus a scourging. And after he had declared, I find no fault in him. Wow. She heard the condemnation pronounced by Pilate and saw, saw, him give it, saw him give Christ up to the murderers. Watch the bottom. She still, still, she saw, an, still another scene gaze came to her gaze. She saw Christ seated upon the white throne. Watch the bottom now. And with a cry of terror, cry, cry, cry of terror as she awoke from her dream, at once she wrote Pilate. You know what she said to Pilate? In fact, the same time when he was about to execute that judgment, she said, have nothing to do with this just man. For I have suffered many things of him in a dream. Now, my friends... 
just imagine Jesus was abused and Jesus now was placed in comparison to Barabbas. Notice verse 5 and final. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and Pilate said unto him, Behold the man. Behold the man. Wonder, O heaven, and be astonished, O earth. Behold the oppressor and the oppressed. A modern throng encircled, enclosed, the savior of the world, mocking and jeering and mingling with coarse oath of blasphemy, is lowly birth and a humble life are commented upon by the unfeeling mob. His claim to be the son of God is ridiculed and the vulgar jest and insulting sneer are passed from lips to lips. Watch his friends. Satan hurled as much as he can upon him. And watch the words in yellow. It was his purpose to provoke him to retaliation if possible to drive him to perform one miracle. To release himself, I put one there, but perform a miracle. And to thus break the plan of salvation. One stain upon his human life. One failure, friends, of his humanity to endure the terrible tests. The Lamb of God would, not, would have been an imperfect offering. And the redemption of man, a failure. Watch down at the bottom. Submitted with perfect calmness to the court's coarsest insult and outrage. Final slide, friends. You know, Pilate managed to put the two together. Here was Barabbas, this hardened criminal, man that was indeed convicted of insurrection, sedition, murder. You know what they said? Pilate says, no. Sent for Barabbas to be brought into the court. He then presented the two prisoners side by side. Pointing to the Savior. He said in a solemn voice of entreaty. Behold the man. Look to Jesus. In fact, I want to tell you friends. Even the rough soldiers felt deep pity for Jesus. They understood that this man had been brought without a cause. He had endured so much. Yet still they said, give us Barabbas and away with this man. Crucify him. My question to you friends this morning, this afternoon. Who will you choose? Behold, I give you Jesus. Humble as he was. Suffering as he was. He spake not a word. We are told he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free. The creator of the universe humbled himself to be abused by those that he came to save. Yet still he was willing to be mocked and abused. Why? Because of his tender love for us. I want to say, behold the man. Behold him, friends. Steer upon him until your heart is broken. And may we truly give all to him, the man of Calvary that was willing to give all for us. What will be your decision today? I pray that you may choose Christ. My charge, my appeal is very simple. Who will you choose today? Will you choose Barabbas, a symbol of Satan? Or will you choose the man Christ Jesus, lowly, humble, that was willing to confirm his faithfulness, his covenant towards each and every one of us, promise of the assurance of eternal life by his blood, by his sacrifice, by his humiliation. I pray that you will behold a man and that you will choose 
Jesus. Let us pray. Eternal loving Father, indeed thou knowest, Lord, what Jesus went through. But while he went through it, he knew he had to go through it. But he still did it. So terrible was the temptation. We are told to let man suffer the consequence of his own sin. But Jesus would not even yield in thought to his own desires. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. He submitted to the plan of the Father. Oh, I pray that you may humble our hearts. At times we seek self-exaltation. We seek to want to assert our own rights. Yet still, we were your rights. You had more rights than anybody else. You were innocent. But you are willing to take the abuse for our sake. Oh God have mercy upon us. May we behold the Lamb of God. May we behold his humility. And may truly as he is lifted up before us. May our hearts be broken. And may we say Lord I give you my heart. Even right now. As we are praying. Maybe there is someone that want to say Lord I want to give you my heart. I pray you may impress that one to do so even now. And as they give you their hearts, come into their life and make them a new person with new purpose and new intents by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for your love. Bless us to the sin. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.